Hello, it's Pastor Jack Cummings with Doorway of Hope in Hamlin, West Virginia. Thank you for joining me for the book of Revelation, Why I Quit Believing in the Rapture, Part 5. Now, we've picked up uh, several subscribers over the last few teachings, so I'd like to welcome the new subscribers. Also, I'd like to stop, thank all of you for stopping by. Uh, you have no idea what it means to me. Uh, we're so eager to get the word out, get this message out, that uh, it really is a blessing to me that uh, people are watching. So thank you so much. And I need to apologize for the amount of time it took to get this teaching out. I make all these slides myself as well as the text, uh, the script, and it takes a little time. I also like to restudy what I'm telling you. Our goal on this channel is to look for the truth, find the truth, and present the truth. That's it. I've got no other agenda than to find the truth and share it. So uh, also, in doing that, I have a tendency to go over everything with a magnifying glass. Uh, you can say I run bunny trails or spend a lot of time over in the grass, and this lesson was no exception. However, after making many slides about angels and biblical numerology to talk about Chapter 7, a bunch of other things, I realized it was not pertinent to our discussion, which is why I stopped believing in the rapture and because of the revelation in the book of Revelation. I stopped, one of the reasons I stopped believing in the rapture. So I had to go back through and edit all the work I had done, uh, but, you know, may do a future teaching on what I found out anyway. The thing that I need to focus on, the thing that I want to focus on, is how a lot of the scriptures in Revelation have already been fulfilled and are not on hold until a horrible seven-year period in the future known as the seven-year Great Tribulation period. So we left off last time at the end of chapter 6, so uh, we'll be reading chapter 7, not really as an in-depth study, uh, but really just to get from the seals to the, to the trumpets, because that was really what impressed me about Revelation and about uh, historicism. So uh, this is part 5 of this series. We covered the seals in part 4, which was Revelation chapter 6. If you're new to this channel, we're discussing the book of Revelation in the way that the Protestant reformers understood it. And that was that the seals and the trumpets dealt with the pagan Roman Empire and the vials dealt with the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church. So on your screen, you should see a rude map. And I say it's a rude map because I drew this map. A lot of the maps that you find are copyrighted, so I just drew one. So if you look at it and say, well, I don't think that county's that, that country's that big. Well, it probably isn't. Uh, this is just for teaching purposes, okay? Uh, you sh see a rude map of the, during the 4th century, the Roman Empire. Uh, everything you see in purple was under the, the control of the Roman Empire. We have two different color purples as the empire was divided into the east and the west already in 395 AD. The western part of the empire was ruled from Rome until 408 when they moved the capital to Ravenna as they felt, they, I guess they knew that the Roman Empire was getting weak and they felt like Ravenna was an easier city to defend and the eastern part of the empire was ruled from Constantinople. Now Rome was still used uh, for celebrations and things like that. It was more ceremonial. Uh, but the official capital was Ravenna and before this lesson is over, uh, we'll see how this map changed quite a bit during the blowing of the first four trumpets of Revelation. That's all we're going to get covered in this lesson is the first four trumpets. Again, we need to go through chapter 7. And I'm pretty sure I've done this before. I can't seem to find where I've done it before, but in case you're not familiar with this area, uh, this is the Mediterranean Sea. You see that in the, in the middle there. you got the Black Sea and you got the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, you have three continents involved. You've got Africa, Europe, and Asia all involved there in the Roman Empire. Isn't that incredible? And uh, all kinds of nations. Now, these are the names of the nations that's there today. There's more nations than this. Just to give you a rough idea, just uh, my slide says nations to name a few. You got Wales. Uh, that was part of the Roman Empire at this time. England, Spain, France, Italy, of course. Uh, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Albania, Greece, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt, Libya, um, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, again, just to name a few, but there's uh, there's some of the nations that is in that area. So uh, we're going to do more with this map later, but uh, let's let's get on with the lesson here. Now, 
I was raised in a Christian home that believed wholeheartedly in the futurist view of eschatology, and I, I would I would guess I never really thought about it, but a few weeks ago I realized we was really sort of addicted to it because everything that happened was apparently right there in the scriptures, and the rapture could happen any minute. I lived my life that way until I asked the Lord to show me the truth, and I'm simply taking you on this journey that he took me. And while I absolutely hate labels, and at one time I guess there wasn't any labels when it came to end times, but after the Council of Trent that we discussed last time, there were at least three belief systems concerning end times. Then a fourth one rose up as well. Do you ever think about that? That there's actually four different belief systems, not just the one you adhere to. There's there's four total. So uh, <clears throat> I'm figuring that uh, hopefully one of those is correct. Good chance that uh, three of them are incorrect. So anyway, uh, as I said earlier, I was raised in a home that believed in futurism. Let's read these, okay? Here's the four different views of eschatology. Eschatology is the study of end times. You've got historicism, which dates back to approximately 300 A.D., and this is what we're looking at in this teaching. Uh, and it, it is a belief that the prophecies of Scripture were given to man in symbolic language and that they have been fulfilled throughout history. This view of interpretation was held by such men as Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin, John Knox, John Wesley, William Tyndale, and Isaac Newton, and that is just a few of the people who believed this. Then you've got futurism. Uh, Irenaeus of Lyon in 202 AD, I guess that was the seed of futurism. He believed, he began to believe, and I guess teach and share or whatever, that the 70th week of Daniel hadn't been fulfilled yet. Now we covered that in part two of this teaching, that uh, the 70th week of Daniel had indeed been fulfilled, but uh, he began to believe that it hadn't. <clears throat> and at that time, the belief died with him but was revived by Francisco Ribera in 1585 A.D., and Manuel Lacunza, he added to that belief in the late 1700s. Uh, this belief was part of the Catholics' counter-reformation, and this belief system believes that all things are yet to be fulfilled. So if you believe that a future Antichrist is coming, a future one world government is coming, a future horrible, awful things is coming, then you adhere to the futurist view. Uh, the, the, then you have preterism. Uh, this belief system was also a part of the Catholic counter-reformation efforts and was penned by Louis D. Alcazar in 1613. This belief system believes that all prophecy was fulfilled under Nero as well as the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So they believe that that's all about that. And I know some people who adhere to the preterist view. Um, then you have idealism, which appears to have begun in the late 1800s and is an approach to interpretation that believes that everything is symbolic. Nothing is considered literal except the second coming and the judgment of Jesus Christ. And I know one person that appears to adhere to that belief system. Okay. So. As I said earlier, I was raised in a home that believed in futurism, hook, line, and sinker. But once I was exposed to historicism, I'd never heard of it before. I prayed that God would show me the truth. Uh, once I was exposed to it and I studied it, I didn't just read a book. I did read a book, but the books that I read, I would study what they had to say. And I encourage you. Don't knee-jerk reaction this teaching and just say, well, this guy's crazy, you know, or whatever. I'm begging you. You know, when you spend time uh, studying this for yourself, it it becomes yours. It becomes a part of you. And uh, you've also, if you have if you was raised in a different belief system, you've got strongholds in your mind that, you that you know, need to come down. Uh, you know, so anyway, there's that. But once I got a hold of historicism, I am totally convinced that it is correct, even though I'd never heard of it before in my life, <clears throat> before I prayed for understanding. So, um, so I've already read the slide. There we have our four main belief systems. And again, as you saw, the Protestant reformers believed in the historicist view. And at that time, really, 
There was no other view until Ribera in 1585 when he either, you can believe what you want to believe, he either received the revelation or he dreamed it up to protect the Pope from being exposed as the Antichrist. And we have a six-part teaching so far on this channel about the Pope being the Antichrist. So if you're interested in that, you can take a look at that. So it's totally your call. Now I'm going to guess that um, you're very passionate about your belief system. I'm starting to learn that people are very passionate about their belief system. And uh, the truth is, I'm just talking truth here, we tend to stick with the belief system that we were born into. And I can remember my dad telling me about the rapture of the church. And uh, he said, you know, my dad was uh, 59 year, 49 years old when I was born. And uh, he said, good chance that the rapture wouldn't take place in his lifetime but that it would uh, probably take place in my lifetime. I can remember being a very young boy and uh, my dad telling me that. So uh, I'm sure you have memories of sitting on your papa's lap or sitting at the table with your mother or your favorite aunt or whatever and hearing these belief systems. And so this stuff that we've carried with us all of our lives, we're just very, very passionate about it. And so I get it. I understand that, you know, um, so there's a very good chance you believe whatever you was raised in, and I understand that. And uh, when I discovered historicism, I was uh, 56 years old. So all my life, I believed the futurist teaching. Not only did I believe it, I taught it. So uh, there's that. I've been a teacher for many, many years. So let's take a look at that. Um, and I, I debated whether or not to do this, but I, I think somebody may get something out of this if if you're not that somebody, please bear with me. We'll get to the scriptures here in just a minute. But so you've got four different views of eschatology. You got historicism, futurism, preterism, and idealism. And uh, so there's four. And I only knew a two when I was growing up. That was preterism and futurism. And I, I was pretty sure the preterist was wrong because I was a futurist. So they had to be wrong, right? Um, <clears throat> now, let's say we had an evenly matched field where. Uh, you've got 250 people, each one, say you got got 1,000 people, and 250 people believe each one of those four different doctrines. If that was the case, you would have a 25% chance of being born, if everybody was having babies at the same time, you'd have a 25% chance of being born into the correct uh, doctrine. Isn't that interesting? So, anyway... Um, you like those odds? You like that 25% odds? I, I don't know. I don't like those odds, really. And that's if we was on an even playing field. Um, the truth is that because of the Schofield Bible, which Schofield, that's that's how this infiltrated the church, the futurist view infiltrated the church. It was put in the Schofield Bible. And that Bible, interestingly enough, was printed in 1908, and that was two years after the last great revival began in America. And, of course, I'm talking about Azusa Street. So I wonder what has happened that has stopped a great any great revivals from raising up in America uh, since Azusa Street. Hmm, that's interesting. Something to ponder, just something to ponder. So anyway, uh, in looking at our Revelation timeline, we're getting getting to the lesson now. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, here's our recap of the of the timeline. Um, in 96 AD, you had the White Horse, which was the time of the Five Good Emperors. That was when Rome conquered. This was all covered in uh, Part 4. We're just uh, recapping it. And uh, I noticed in one of the, um, in one of the comments, uh, they said, you know, that white never represents uh, anything uh evil in the Bible, and um, I don't know if they didn't listen to the teaching or what, but the reason it was a white horse, this was the time that Rome was conquering. It, it grew t during that 100 years, or 90 years, it grew to the biggest that it ever was, and when at that time, when Rome would conquer a nation, they had a big parade, a big celebration, and the emperor rode into town uh, rode into that nation on a white horse. So it's not about good and evil. It's about this is what they'd done at that time. They rode a white horse in because they'd conquered the place. So, And what was that guy doing? He was going out conquering and to conquer. 
in 185 AD, and you can see some of these overlap a little bit. But if you look on the left-hand column, 96, 185, 200, 253, 03, 313, you will see that it comes straight down the line. It just comes straight down through history. Uh, 185 AD to 284 AD, there was the Red Horse. The Roman Empire suffered civil war at that time. 200 AD to 250 AD, there was a Black Horse. That's when high taxes and inflation was running rampant. People was bringing in uh, their food to pay their taxes. That's why you got a, a measure of wheat for a penny. Uh, in 250 to 300 AD, you had the Pale Green Horse, which was famine and disease that uh, happened in the Roman Empire at that time. 303 A.D. to 313 A.D. was the era of the martyrs or the Diocletian persecution. That was the worst uh, persecution that Rome had. Uh, they, there was 10 different ones. We'll touch base on it here in a minute again. But uh, so and then you, a, after that ended, uh, Constantine signed an edict, the Edict of Milan, saying that Christianity was legal in 313, and Christianity slowly became the state religion of the empire. Those are the six seals. So that ends chapter six. So let us now begin with chapter seven. And I think if we understand the timeline, chapter seven is not difficult to understand. And I remember when I was a futurist, these interpretations were always changing. We were always struggling to make things fit, depending on what the current political climate was, whoever was in politics, whoever the new president was, or the king of Israel or whatever. And uh, it's, that's the nature of that belief system. Since nothing has happened yet in the future's view, you're always looking for what's going to happen. I get it. You have to keep your eyes open so you don't miss things when they do start happening. Now, uh, <clears throat> if you don't believe what I'm saying is true about that, go down to the Christian bookstore, and you'll find brand new books from futurist teachers. that are, They've already written dozens of books, but they got a new one. Because they have a new revelation on revelation. I'd, I'd guess and thank God we got the revelation I'm sharing with you now before COVID. Thank you, Jesus, that everybody in the futures camp has been in a panic since COVID came. I remember at work one day, a fellow came up to me, and uh, he had just recently, after COVID came out, he rededicated his life to the Lord. And it was mainly because in Matthew 24, 7, Jesus said that there would be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. So, you know, that's a plague. So he came up to me and he said, what do you, what do you think about COVID? And I said, I don't think anything about it at all. And I don't, I didn't, whatever. Um, and we're not going down that rabbit trail. Um, we could, I could have a whole nother channel about what I believe about all that, but uh, the truth's coming out. Amen. Praise God. We pray for that all the time. Truth's come out. So I told him I didn't think anything about it. And whatever, whatever your belief system is, okay, we should not, as Christians, our lives should not be dominated by fear. That, that is one of the things that God is really putting in me, and I'm sharing it with my church we should not be controlled by fear. We just shouldn't. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We should not be driven by fear. But I really believe that a lot of people are. And like I said, I remember when I was in the futurist camp, man, it, everything was a panic. And no matter what happened, it was a panic. You better make sure you're prayed up. I used to tell people, you better be ready to go. You better be prayed up, man. This thing's coming down. I used to say it all the time. God loves you, okay? You you need to get a hold of that. If you do not have a revelation of God's love for you, take a year off and just meditate on God's love. Um, once, once I get done with this teaching, not tonight, but I've got several more parts of this teaching to do. Once I'm done with that, back in 2016, uh, God really dealt with me about his love for me. And I spent three months... All I did was meditate on the love of God, and I dug in the scripture to find more about the love of God. And I'm telling you, it changed the lives of people that got a hold of that. I shared that with my church. I shared that with everybody that I came in contact with. And it'll change your life. You get a hold of the love of God, it will absolutely change your life. When, and you got to understand, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were born 
into the family of God. You're God's child. There's no reason to fear. There's, and I'm not talking about a fear of God, a respect for God. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being driven by fear. The spirit of fear is a master spirit, and you need to overcome that master spirit. There's a word There's a word in the Bible that says, I'll call it Abba. We'll call it Abba. It could be Abba, Abba. That means father in the New Testament. It's only used three times. Okay, that word's only used three times in Scripture. Okay, uh, it's the first word that uh, the little Hebrew children learn. You know, instead of saying da da, they say Abba. And here's the three times that it's used in in Mark fourteen thirty six. This is Jesus talking, and he said Abba, Father. That was the term that Jesus used for the Father was Abba. All things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. Okay. Then in Romans 8, 15, it's used in connection with us. It says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You have not received the spirit of bondage to fear. You are not to be fearful. God loves you. God's crazy about you. He died for your sins. He died. Jesus came and died so you can have fellowship with the Father and with him and the Holy Spirit. And he says, you've not, not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It's the same word, the exact same word that Jesus used to describe the Father. The Holy Spirit the, the, uh, says through, through Paul that we can use that same word to mean Father God. Isn't that something? The very same word. <clears throat> in Galatians it says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. You're adopted in the family of God. Jesus said, told Nicodemus, you got to be born again. <clears throat> We've been born again. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. You are a son of God. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ Jesus, through Christ. So anyway, that's the first word that the little Hebrew children learn. And some of us don't, don't have it yet. And it's, you got to spend time. You got to put forth effort. A lot of this stuff, you got to put forth effort. I had such a low self-esteem. Uh, I I really needed a revelation of the love of God, and uh, He gave me a revelation. And but when you look at the love of God, how vast it is. I got a thimble of it. I got a taste, and uh, it's good stuff. But uh, once I get done with these teachings, I I kept a journal during those times. And I plan on during a doing a um, a video of that journal. And I trust me, you will be blessed. You will be blessed if you join me for that. You will be blessed. But God loves you. We need to get fear out of our lives. Uh, the one who is holding it all is also holding you. It always uh, seemed to me the future's view was driven by fear. But perfect love casts out fear. So anyway, so let's get our text, and then we'll cover what's necessary to stay on course. So, we're 7a. <clears throat> and uh, after these things, so that's how it starts, seven, verse 7-1. Seven, and after these things, after what things? Is the breaking of the seals. This is how, here's how we're going to approach this chapter, okay? Like I said, I'm trying to streamline it. Still going to look under some rocks, but we're trying to streamline it. That this is, we call this the time between the judgments, all right? So the sixth seal, as we've already discussed, happened, but it, it fulfilled that timeline through 313 A.D. to 390 A.D., which was the Roman Empire adopt Christianity, <clears throat> okay? And so then we see this seventh chapter begins with after, this th after these things. So the timeline we're looking at in chapter 7 begins after 390 A.D., after Rome adopts Christianity and outlaws paganism, that actually they became Christianity became the state religion in 380, but the effort to stamp out paganism took a few years, which we covered last time. Now the breaking of the seventh seal is the blowing of the trumpets. When the seventh seal is broken, the angels get ready to blow their trumpets, which is judgment on the pagan Roman Empire. 
Now, just like the seals, uh, we're going to see these trumpets played out in history, the judgment on the Roman Empire right down the line. So the first trumpet, and right there you see it, the first trumpet's blown in 400 to 410 A.D., so the seventh chapter takes place between the sixth seal and the first trumpet, uh, roughly 10 to 30 years, depending on when you want to start your clock. So now you can see that, and that's how we'll see it fulfilled. The first trumpet was 410 A.D. Uh, the second trumpet was 425 to 470. The third trumpet was 451. Uh, the fourth trumpet was 476. The fifth trumpet was 612 through 762. And the sixth trumpet was 1062 to 1453. So uh, interesting. It's amazing, isn't it? So um, anyway, the, the seventh chapter covers those 10 to 20 years or 30 years, whenever you want to start your clock. If you want to start it in, in uh, 380, when it becomes a Christian nation, then we could say, well, uh, from 380 to 410, you know, it's 30 years. Or you could do it, whatever, but it comes right down the line. All right? All right. So, uh, and these things, and after these things, I saw four angels standing uh, on the four corners of the earth, and uh, holding the four winds of the earth, and that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So during this time, between the sixth seal and the first trumpet, there was a whole lot of sealing going on. That's what he was saying. Don't don't do anything. Don't don't let anything happen to the earth, the sea, the trees, until we've sealed our servants in their foreheads. Okay. So right after Rome became a Christian nation, and I believe this makes a lot of sense. What happened? What would happen if 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 a nation outlawed all pagan worship? And said, everybody in this nation has got to be Christian. If you're going to go to church, it's got to be a Christian church. What would happen? Well, people would join the church. And some of them would even get saved. <laughs> Not just join the church, they'd actually get saved. See how simple that is? What's happening here? People's getting saved. What's this ceiling that's taking place? People are getting saved. Amen? Now, uh, now we come to a place where a lot of teaching hit the cutting room floor. I did a lot of editing right here, but let us proceed. This way we can make it to the trumpets in this teaching, okay? So he says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any trees. The four winds are conflicts, they're wars, they're attacks. This is what was coming to the Roman Empire, but there were angels holding these things back for a period of time. Uh, I listened to a teaching the other day, and a guy was talking about Edward Gibbon, who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And Edward Gibbon, in that book, and he's an atheist. I, I believe he was an atheist. He said in that book that during this time that it seemed like everything was in place, but nothing was happening, like everything was just being held in place. And that's exactly what we see here. These angels are holding this in place. They're not letting anything happen until a big group of people get saved. Pray, praise God. So, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. This represents God's protection for his people. This All this stuff that we're getting ready to talk about when we get to the trumpets was getting ready to happen. And the protection of God for his people was to seal them, okay? He didn't take them out. He didn't say, oh, we got to get you out of here. He has the power to protect his people, praise the Lord. I'm starting to enjoy this teaching a little bit. So thank you, Jesus. So that seal represents God's protection for his people. That's what he said. Don't do anything until we seal them. And then you can do whatever you want because they're sealed. They're protected. This seal that he's talking about is like a signet ring. Uh, like the same seal, I preached on this a few weeks ago, like the same seal that we saw on the seals on the scroll, 
you know, we know that God was sitting on his throne and he sealed that scroll um, with his seal. So now this angel has got that same seal, that same metal uh, object or signet ring that would have that seal of God on it. Praise God. <clears throat> and it represents protection and it represents genuineness. If you if you got a scroll from somebody back in those days and it had their seal on it, you knew it was genuine. Because who's got their seal but them, okay? Uh, so uh, we know that this seal shows that these people are genuine and that they're protected. We're told in 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth uh, them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, uh, an interesting thing happens, all right? When we get to verse 3, we see the seal is placed in the forehead. This is a spiritual application. And once it turns, it's so, so neat. These two words are two different. They mean two different things. Seal, when it says he's got the seal, that's the signet ring. That's the stamp. But then he says they're going to seal them. And they were sealed, okay? Till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Once it turns from seal to sealed, that term sealed is often used in connection with the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord God. Um, in Ephesians 1.10, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in the earth. And we're going to see that play out a little bit more. Heaven and earth, heaven and earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him uh, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, and whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed, same word, same exact word, as we see here in, in uh, Revelation uh, 8.3, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Thank you, Jesus. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. This is Ephesians 4, 29 and 30. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to, you, to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of, of God, whereby ye were sealed, until the day of redemption. It's the same exact thing. So what's taking place here in chapter 7? If people's getting re receiving the Holy Spirit, well, people's getting saved, man. It's awesome. So, um, now while I've cut a large portion of this teaching out, I still would like to take the time to mention that many times, this is awesome, in the book of Revelation, you will see a solitary angel doing something. And, I, and when I say that, I'm not talking about you know, seven angels and one of them blows a trumpet. Uh, seven angels and one of them pours out a vial. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about many times you will see a singular angel, not one of the seven, but a singular angel doing something, okay? Now, I'm going to show you some places where this happens. And when we look at what that angel's doing, it makes us think maybe it's not an angel, okay? And bear with me. Um, and we're not going to do a deep dive here. But I feel like it's necessary to mention it mainly uh, for something for you to ponder. And, and uh, I'll be mentioning it later several times throughout the teachings. I'll be talking about this, okay? So we're going to look at these singular angels. Here's some of them. It might be all of them, but here's some of them. Uh, <clears throat> now, this book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ, isn't it? So Jesus is being revealed in this book. I hope y'all's having a good time as I am. I'm having a good time. So what are these angels? Oh, let's read that. What are these angels doing? Okay. In Revelation 7, 2, he saw an angel ascending from the east with the seal of God. What do we say the seal of God is? It's the Holy Spirit. Here's this angel coming with the Holy Spirit. If you want to believe that's the seal of God, and I do. And he's commanding, he's commanding the angels to hold back the four winds. In Revelation 8, 3, an angel operating in the office of the high priest, 
handling the golden censer in heaven, is offering prayers to the Father. In Revelation 10, 1, a mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. When a lion roareth. Ain't that something? And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Amen. Uh, Revelation 20, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Well, now, what are these angels doing? Let's take a look at that. What are these angels doing? Well, in 7-2, it has the seal of the living God, which turns out to be the Holy Spirit. Who is it that seals people with the Holy Spirit? In 8-3, we see an angel operating in the office of the high priest. Who's the high priest? In 10-1, in, uh, we see an angel instrumental in the Renaissance and the invention of the printing press. Where does the divine inspiration come from? Where do you get that? In 18-1, we see an angel that has great power and all the earth is enlightened with his glory. Who could that be? Who's going to enlighten the world with his glory? Hmm. And in 20, we see an angel that has the key to the bottomless pit that grabs Satan and binds him a thousand years. Who is it that we're told that has, has that key? Who's got that key? These are revelations of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has the authority and the power and the glory to do all these things. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, I don't I don't want to do a deep dive on this at this time, but I feel it's interesting to note. And before you get too upset, so I'm not listening to this guy, he's crazy. You might remember that many times in the Old Testament, we see an angel of the Lord doing something. And many times <clears throat> that turns out to be Jesus or God even. There's even a term for that. It's theophany or Christophany. You can look those up which are manifestations of God or of Christ. Abraham, you might remember, uh, was visited by God before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. That was God, because he said, should I, should I not show Abraham what I'm getting ready to do? You know, <clears throat> when Moses encountered the burning bush, it says that the angel of the Lord spoke to him from the fire. Well, we know that was God. The angel of the Lord lived in Gilgal. I didn't know this. I read this so many times and missed it. But if you go to Judges 2.1, you will see that the angel that battled with them when they entered into the promised land settled in Gilgal, and he lived with them in Gilgal. And uh, then one day he said, y'all sitting like crazy, I'm leaving. Yeah, so there's that. And there's more times than that. But anyway, so we see that take place in the Old Testament. And you say, well, explain all that. To I can't. I can't explain all that to you other than to say God's God and God does what he wants. So, um, here we go, Revelation 7, 4. <clears throat> I really hope my voice holds out to get this finished. This makes the third time that I've started this teaching. And uh, anyway, let's hope that God bless my throat, bless, bless my voice. Revelation uh, 7, 4, it says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, we could go down this road with the symbolism of the 144,000, what that means. Uh, but really, like I said before, that had nothing to do with how it affected my view on Revelation. I may do a deeper study of this chapter at a later time, but I think right now it's just, it's really not necessary. And again, if you go looking at commentaries and stuff, man, everybody's got a different take on this stuff. <clears throat> not, not the seals, not the trumpets, not the, not, you know, but there's some uh, connecting scriptures uh, that people have a different view on. And I really believe that people get sidetracked by the number, 144,000. It sidetracks them. And I, I think we don't need to get sidetracked. People's getting saved. That's what's happening. So um, this, this was some of the stuff I edited out before. I really believe that some people, again, I was just going to repeat that, 
Um, people are just getting saved because Rome became a Christian nation. All right. So now here's 144,000. Uh, you got 12,000 from Judah. You got 12,000 from Reuben. 12,000 from Gad, Asher, Nephtalim. Neft, uh, that's how I'm going to say it. Uh, Nephtali. That's how it. That's how it is in the Old Testament. Nephtali, Manasseh, Simon, Levi, Ishkar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Uh, and you got 12 from each tribe. That's 144,000. Okay. Um, now we could we could go off on the, on a bunny trail that uh, this doesn't mention all the tribes. And if you get to studying that, you'll see that it doesn't. Uh, but anyway, um, what, we'll, we're going to refrain from that. But after after Rome turned to a Christian nation, a lot of people got saved. Even Hebrews were converted. That's what we're seeing here. I mean, that's that's how simple it is. People got saved. Okay, after this I beheld in lo a great multitude, which no man could number. And I, I wonder... Uh, how many Gentiles got saved during this time? What do you think? A bunch? Maybe a bunch? I think a bunch. Of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, uh, these are the nations that made up the Roman Empire. You may remember our discussion on that when we discussed uh, Matthew 24, nation rising against nation. These were the nations that made up the empire. They were made up of kindreds and peoples and tongues. You may remember during the Roman Jewish Wars, Vespasian and Titus, I had Josephus, they captured Josephus, and they kept him around as an interpreter. Why? They didn't speak Hebrew. They didn't know Hebrew. They spoke Latin or Greek. So uh, the empire was made up of many nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues. What we see here, those people got saved. The Roman Empire became Christian. People got saved. They outlawed paganism. People got saved. And again, people joined the church, but some of them actually got saved. And, and I think you know what I'm saying. So what was they doing? Okay, so they stood before his throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Uh, talking about palm leaves, praising the Lord. Now, a lot of people take this verse and they say, well, this scene's in heaven. So these people are dead. It's talking about dead people. Right? And that, again, everybody's got a different take on this chapter. It's incredible. And that's fine, I guess. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways that people interpret this. A literal, they interpret it literal. Some people believe the 144,000 was literal. Some people believe it's symbolic. Um, everything in between. And while some, not all, uh, say that these are people are dead and in heaven, I mean, they're around the throne. But doesn't the Bible tell us uh, that Christ, in Ephesians 2 6, Christ has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ, through Christ Jesus. Paul also went on to say, talking about the throne, Paul also went on to, well, we don't know that Paul wrote Hebrews. So the writer of the Hebrews in 4.16 said, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. These people was around the throne. Well, they got saved. They have access to the throne of God now. Praise the Lord. Uh, to find help in time of need, I, I don't. I don't believe these people were dead. I believe this is simply people being saved, not dying. So what was they doing? Uh, they were uh, in seven ten. They cried with a loud voice, saying, "Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb." And all the angels stood around about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. So we see the angels worshiping at the same time. We see the elders worshiping as well. Now, what, what do you make of that? Well, a lot of times in Scripture, actually 27 different times, it talks about heaven and earth, heaven and earth, heaven and earth. Uh, one of my favorite scriptures that says this is Ephesians three fourteen and 15, when Paul said, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We're all in the family of God. Praise God. Heaven and earth, it's together. And uh, so I believe these people got saved. They're worshiping God. And guess what's happening in heaven while they're worshiping God? Well, heaven's worshiping God too. You go to heaven, you're going to be worshiping God, I'm telling you. Uh, I've always felt like while we're worshiping here on earth, 
or simply joining in with the worship that's going on around the throne already. I accepted my gift of salvation after my father and mother both passed away. Uh, but for years, it blessed me to know that uh, when I was worshiping the Lord, they were worshiping right along with me. Or should I say, I was worshiping with them. And um, I know a lot of people don't believe that. I've had comments from people that don't believe that, you know, when we die, our spirit goes to heaven. I believe it. I believe it. Um, and maybe I do a teaching on it sometime. It's it's a whole different deal. But, uh, you know, Paul said to be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. So I, I take his word for it. I believe that. Um, you know, and then we could go into teaching about Lazarus. Uh, you know, when he died, not, not Lazarus, the, the brother of Mary and Martha, but Lazarus that Jesus talked about and said, the rich man and Lazarus died. He saw in Abraham's bosom. Um, you know, we could go into all that, but your spirit goes somewhere. And uh, Jesus, we're told, went into the heart of the earth, preached to the people in the heart of the earth when he died. Paradise at that time was in the heart of the earth. Jesus told the guy on the cross, you'll be with me today in paradise. But what does it say later? It says that when he ascended, he led captivity captive. Who was captive? People in the heart of the earth were captive. He led them out. And we know that uh, the Bible tells us that the, the graves burst open and they saw people resurrected at that time, walking around. These people went on to heaven. He emptied hell out. He emptied paradise out. Paradise is now in heaven. So when you die, that's where you go. Um, and I got over in that farther than I wanted to, but um, that's my belief. And I've got scripture that makes me believe that that's correct. And, you know, um, if you are if you find scripture that disproves your belief, go with scripture. Amen. Change your belief. So, uh, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these that are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Some of the newer versions like to put uh, thee in there, but uh, this is the King James. You'll see the Z's not in there. So uh, the you King James people, you'll be glad to know uh, the great tribulation ain't in there. It's nowhere in, you'll find nowhere in scripture, in uh, the older translations that say the great tribulation, they ain't one. So Foxes tells us there were 10 great persecutions of Christians under the Roman Empire, but once it became a Christian empire, these persecutions by the empire ceased. The gospel had survived, and now they don't have to worry about persecutions anymore. These are they that came out of great persecution. They remain faithful, and then all of a sudden, Rome's a Christian nation. Hallelujah. So uh, the persecutions are over. And it says, And they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Uh, now we're, we know there's a temple in heaven. Uh, we'll see an angel coming out of it in a moment. But there's also a temple on the earth. Right? Where's that temple at? Well, it's us. So if you're serving God day and you can serve God day and night in your temple right now. So I believe that these people was on the earth. These people are getting saved. They don't have to hide no more. They don't have to worry no more. They can come boldly to the throne of grace. They can worship and praise God and witness and do whatever the Holy Spirit tells them to do because those that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. So, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Okay, what did Jesus say when he was here? Jesus told us that he would dwell with us in John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he'll keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Uh, and then it says, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. John six thirty five, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. These people are just getting saved. I mean, hallelujah that they're getting saved, but that's what's happening here in chapter 7. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. What's the sun represent? We've talked about this. We've talked about this. The sun represents rulers. In this case, it's the rulers of the Roman Empire. What does that mean? The sun, the rulers of the Roman Empire, will no more persecute Christians, and the Roman Empire didn't, okay? 
Um, what does the heat represent? What's well, the persecution? And there ain't going to be no more of it. Hallelujah. Ain't going to be no more of it. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto living water, fountains of water, and God shall wipe, wipe away all tears from their eyes. I can't imagine the rejoicing of those Christians at that time to know that there would be no more persecution in their lifetime. That's just incredible. And I believe that the day is coming when the church is going to rise up. Um, America will eventually turn back to God. I hope it happens in my lifetime. But I believe that, uh, you know, in, in Daniel, we see that stone, when we're looking at the statues, we see that stone cut from a mountain and it hits the kingdoms of the earth in the feet. And then that stone fills the earth, the earth, the whole earth. The whole earth is filled with that mountain. And so uh, America, while it's uh, in bad shape right now, America will return to God. It may not happen in our lifetime, but it will return to God. All the earth will return to God. It will. Uh, what did God say? I'll give you the nation. Told Jesus, I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. It's happening. It's coming. It's coming. And if you quit listening to the mainstream media and start getting your news somewhere else, you're going to find that uh, there's some revivals breaking out all over the world. There's some people rising up against the globalist regime. There's some people that's rising up against the LGBTQ, RSD, whatever, uh, coming up against that. So holiness and righteousness is coming. There's kids in schools that are rising up against stuff and saying, we're not doing that anymore. If you never watched Steve Turley, uh, you might want to check Steve Turley out. He He's, I get a lot of news from that guy. He's awesome. So, uh, so anyway, so uh, imagine the the celebration. Imagine the praise and worship after the church rises up and takes America back. And I believe it's coming. No more lying media. No more grooming of our children in their movies and their cartoons. No more CRT and grooming in the schools or the public libraries. Why have we got to do that in the public libraries? Yeah. Uh, no more perversion in the church. It'd be awesome. What kind of rejoicing you think take place? Pretty good stuff. So that's my take on chapter seven. Uh, it appears that amongst all others, there's different takes on chapter seven. Uh, so if you see things different, that's fine. That's fine. See things different. That's my take. So, and you know, as we learn and grow, chances are my take will change, but that's where I'm at right now. All right, let's move on to chapter eight. Eight, all right. And uh, when he had opened the sixth, seventh seal, uh, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Most people believe that this is simply the calm before the storm, and who knows what actually was taking place on the earth as the calm played out in heaven. Uh, more than likely, more people was getting added to the kingdom. Now, uh, Edward Given, I think I mentioned him before. Did I? Well, I've done this thing three times, so I don't know if I've mentioned it this time or not. But he said. In his book, I watched a teacher the other night, and he was talking about Edward Gibbon, who wrote uh, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. He said that during this period, it was like everything was just on hold. Like for some reason, you could feel the storm coming. You could feel everything happening, but it just seemed like it was on hold. Why did it seem that way? Because the angel with the seal of God in his hand told the angels that was going to bring, let the, let the, the uh, destruction come. Don't do anything yet until we seal the servants of God in their foreheads. Hallelujah. So uh, there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. Um, another interesting thing, there's soon going to be an angel appearing that is offering incense. And as we see in Luke 1.10, when Zacharias went in to burn incense, the people were outside praying. So this angel's getting ready to come out of the temple and, and with incense. And so it may be that while he was in there, there was silence in, let's have a moment of silence. We hear that. Let's have a moment of silence. They were praying. Could be they were praying. So there's a mystery solved. Um, so in Revelation 8, 2, it says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel, here's that solitary angel again, came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, he's high priest, and there was given unto him much incense, 
that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up. You see how God sets my voice? Thank you, Jesus. Ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. Now these are the judgments of God. The voices, thunderings, and lightnings. And we didn't cover it, but uh, it's awesome. When we see in uh, chapter 4, the throne room, I don't like that font, but uh, when we see the throne room in chapter 4, it says, After this uh, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper. A jasper stone is white. At least the study that I did said the jasper stone was white. God is light. God dwells in inapproachable light. God is light in him. There's no darkness at all. And the Bible tells us that we are the sons of the light if we walk in the light. But so around God's throne, when you when John walked up to the throne of God, here's this bright white light coming off of the throne. He could not make out the features of the face because of that light, that glorious light. God is awesome. And the Sardis, Sardis stone, that stone is red. Now, I believe, this is my belief, I believe that that red that's coming off the throne represents the blood of Jesus Christ because it tells us there's a rainbow around the throne. What's that rainbow? What's that rainbow represent? It, after God destroyed the earth with water, he made a covenant with Noah and he said, I will never again destroy the earth with water. And he put a rainbow. He said, I'm going to put uh, my, I think he said my rod or my but my bow in the clouds so that you'll know. And you got to imagine after that, every time that the uh, rain started falling, Noah probably freaked out and uh, he was able to look and say, oh, there's a rainbow. I remember you know, God said, no more. I'm not going to destroy the earth. No more. So that's pretty good. But so that rainbows around the throne as God is sitting on the throne, he sees that rainbow ever before his face around that throne, the covenant that he made with man. And I believe that the red that he sees coming off of coming off the throne, that red that's in front of him all the time, is the covenant that we have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then uh, the rainbow, what in the one in heaven, is looks like an emerald, which is green. Green represents uh, life. The, the circle represents eternal life. So eternal life, right there before the throne all the time in front of God. Praise the Lord. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. Why did we go here? Right here. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. What did we see uh, before in Revelation 8, 5? There were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. These are uh, the judgments of God coming upon the Roman Empire. Uh, the angel took the censer, filled it with fire of the altar. He had the prayers of the saints and cast it to the earth. And there was voices, thunderings, the judgment of God is beginning. Praise God. I think it's uh, I think it's very interesting that he's got the prayers of the saints, all right? In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells us a parable. He says, uh, he spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, uh, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect, praise God? 
which cried day and night unto him, though he bare along with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. How many prayers, how many prayers while the saints were suffering under the persecution of the Roman Empire, and thousands were killed throughout those years and throughout those persecutions, how many times did they cry out to God for vengeance to come upon that wicked kingdom? How many martyrs died at the hands of the Romans, having prayed for deliverance? And you might remember the breaking of the fifth seal. The souls were under the altar. This was last time in, in part four. The souls were under the altar, crying with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? What happened to all those prayers? Well, right there it is, man. Right there's all those prayers. There was given unto him much incense, that's Revelation 8, 3, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints. Those prayers came before God. We see all those prayers gathered up right here, being offered up to God. Today's the day. Every prayer the saints had prayed were not forgotten. There are times in Scripture when we are plainly told that God is waiting for someone or, or a group of people to fill up the bowl of his wrath. Um, first time I think it happens is in Genesis 15, 16, when God is telling Abraham about his descendants being in captivity in Egypt, but he says in the fourth generation they'll come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God gives people time to repent. And if they do not repent, then judgment comes. So there's that. And you might say, well, well, you're telling me that uh, the Roman Empire became a Christian nation. Well, I didn't say they became uh, Christians. I said they became a Christian nation. A lot of the stuff, here's what happened. A lot of, uh, even though they became a Christian nation and they allowed Christianity to flourish, uh, a lot of things that they did in pagan worship, they said, you know, we don't want to lose all these people. You know, we got all these pagan worshipers and stuff, and we don't want to lose them or offend them. So a lot of stuff that the pagan worshipers done was just brought into the church. They they sanctified it and brought it over into the church. And we could go over a great big list. Um, one one of them, um, just just to drop a drop one. Um, you know, when you become um, when you become confirmed. In the Roman Catholic Church, you need to pick a saint to pray to, a dead saint. You're praying to a dead person, not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ ain't dead. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He's our intercessor. He's the only mediator that we have is Jesus Christ. But they look through the saints, and they pick a saint to pray to. Well, we're told plainly in the Old Testament not to seek the dead on behalf of the living not to, to seek the dead for guidance or anything. So that's one of the things that, that when Rome became a Christian nation, they brought a bunch of this pagan stuff over into uh, the Roman Catholic Church and said, yeah, we're going to do this too. And so while it did become a Christian nation and Christians were safe, there was a whole lot of people that now was just darkening the door of the church that wasn't really, and I'm not, I'm not coming against Catholics. I'm talking about that time, at that time. So uh, God's got a lot of people in the Catholic Church. There's a lot of people in the Catholic Church that know him. That's one of the one of the setbacks about getting a hold of this teaching. Everybody thinks you hate Catholics and stuff. I don't. I believe there's Catholics saved. I believe there's Catholics in heaven. And I believe in, I believe it's the 18th chapter that when God is getting ready to finally uh, pour out all of the all of his um, wrath upon the Antichrist kingdom. He says, "Come out of her, my people." And I believe that you're going to see a great um, exodus of the Roman Catholic Church. So that's that's my take. And uh, anyway, if you stick with me, we'll get get deeper into this stuff. Anyway. Um, Many times we see injustices taking place, and we say, why, God, why, when will you move? But the day's coming. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and in the fullness of time, if a person or a nation does not turn, judgment will come. So the angel takes the censer, fills it with fire, casts it to the earth. John Wesley says that all these reactions we see, the voices, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake, especially when it's ended with fire, are emblems of the judgment of God. 
which which is what comes next. We're there now. We're at the trumpets. Hallelujah. So, uh, the first trumpet is the attack of the Goths. And I think I mentioned it already. If I haven't, I will mention it now. Uh, that just like in the Old Testament when God said, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, there'll be a flood, there'll be hail, there'll be all these things we see in Jerusalem. When in Daniel, when he's talking about the fall of Jerusalem, he said the end will come with a flood. Uh, and he's talking about people. And all of these these six trumpets that we're getting, well, we're going to look at the first four, but these six trumpets, they're people. They're groups of people. They're groups of people that God used to bring judgment upon the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? So um, let's see where we're at here. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Um, as we watch this play out, okay. As we watch this play out, the first four of these judgments happen within a hundred years. Now you can look at this. This takes two verses, and you're going to see that these first four uh, trumpets they take a verse or two verses. They're not very long. And and the early Protestants realized that um, if, if something took up a lot of space, if a judgment took up a lot of space in the book of Revelation, it was going to take a long time before it's fulfilled. If it, if it happens in a verse or two, it's going to happen real quick. And these verses, these first four verses, verses that we're going to look at these first four trumpets sorry uh they took they were fulfilled within 100 years boom 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 right now remember the seals happened real quick too but not like not like these uh not as fast as these trumpets did uh the first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees was burned up and all green grass was burned up for the understanding of this these verses let's go back to our map look at our map uh, here's another example of, of me having to edit my teaching a little because I really like to go deep into the background of all these people and where they came from and all that. I had all these slides made about the Goths and everything, and then I had to remind myself it does not matter where these people came from. Uh, the history of the Roman Empire is very well documented and easily found online or in your local bookstore or library. If you want to, if you want to dig deep into the Goths. If you want to dig deep into the fall of the Roman Empire, you can certainly do it quite easily. So I'd made all these slides and everything, uh, but I wanted to streamline this a little because many will only want to know the big picture stuff and not the details. So let's get to it. Uh, let me also add. Oh, and I, I was going to—I knew I had it in my notes somewhere that um, these were people, and there it is in my notes. So uh, there was the Goths uh, rose up. Eventually, in the 4th century, uh, near the end of the 4th century, the Gauls was there on, on the western side of the Black Sea, northern part of the Roman Empire. So the Gauls and the Romans, they'd had a very checkered coexistence. They'd had run-ins in the past and everything. We're going to touch on a little bit, but not in depth. The Roman Empire had some natural boundaries, just like all nations. America stops at the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. Uh, that's a natural boundary. I live in West Virginia. West Virginia has a natural boundary in areas. Uh, the Ohio River is one of them. But one of the boundaries to the Roman Empire was the Danube River, and that was to the north. And they considered anything, the Romans considered anything, on the other side of that river the frontier. That's what they called it, the frontier. Well, there were several people on the other side of the river, and one of those groups of people were the Goths. While some believe they started up in Scandinavia at the time uh, that we're looking at, they had settled on the western side of the Black Sea, north of the Roman Empire, again on the northern side of the Danube River. And they began to attack the Roman Empire in the early 200s, and there were times of peace and times of them working together, and, and first one thing and another, they got along good for a while and then not for a while and whatever. And again, we could spend a lot of time on this, uh, but I'll try to refrain. Um, However, in the late 300s, the Huns began heading west, and they were defeating all the tribes in their path, and they finally reached the Gauls, okay? So in 376 AD, 
the Goths appeared on the banks of the Danube River asking to speak to the emperor of the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, um, which was Emperor Valens. And they wanted to know from him if they could cross and settle on the southern side of the Danube River. And this was arranged. The main reason that Valens allowed them to settle was that he needed to add soldiers to his army that the Roman Empire was suffering. They were supposed to give up their weapons when they crossed, uh, but bribes have always been a common thing. Now the Romans were supposed to take care of them, but failed to do so and actually managed to mistreat them uh, quite horribly, really. And you can read about that. Um, one of the things that stands out and everybody seems to mention is they would take uh, rancid meat or dog meat and they would trade uh, the Goths this meat for their children and they'd sell their children into slavery. But everybody was starving to death, so they did. Um, the Goths eventually wound up in a holding area surrounded by the Roman army and were being allowed to slowly uh, starve to death. So, how nice. And uh, this started the Gothic War. If you ever heard of the Gothic War, this is why it started. And it lasted from 376 to 382. So it lasted six years. And then peace was finally restored. And um, so nothing happened. The Roman Empire was still there, uh, still intact and everything. But peace, when peace was finally restored, the Goths were scattered throughout the Eastern Roman Empire. Okay, they were scattered around pretty good. And, uh, but unity was restored for a while, but in 395 AD, there was a guy named Alaric that became the first king of the Visigoths. And again, you can do a lot of study here, but long story short, in 401 or 402, depending on who you ask, Alaric invaded Italy. He began to invade Italy, he began to invade uh, Eastern Roman Empire. There were battles fought throughout the territory over the next eight years, and then they actually sacked Rome. They went and plundered Rome in 410 AD. They were the first ones to do it, but it was going to become quite common after they did it the first time. From there, they went on to control from the Iberian Pen Peninsula, which is Portugal and Spain, all the way to Eastern Europe. And we'll look at that in a minute. So let's take a look back at our verses, our verse here concerning the first trumpet. The first angel sounded and there followed hail. Hail in prophecy represents an attack coming from the north. Where did this attack come from? From the north. In this part of the world, that's where terrible storms come from, is up north. So hail always represents an attack coming from the north. We see that uh, in Isaiah 28.2. Uh, it says, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm as a flood of mighty waters overflowing shall cast down to the earth with the hand. This was referring to the Assyrian army at that time, that God would use them to bring judgment. And this type of language uh, can also be found in Isaiah 28, 17, Isaiah 32, 19, Haggai 2, 17. So it's, it's, it's a common thing in, in the Old Testament that when God talked about hail, he was talking about somebody attacking from the north, which is exactly what the gospel did. And fire, this could refer to the judgment of God coming uh, through the gospel or the amount of destruction that they did in battle. And I've read that they actually had a scorched earth policy, which means when they moved on from an area, they totally destroyed it to keep the enemy from building it back. Uh, so this fire would be uh, mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees was burned up and all green grass was burned up. Now get this, look at this. After the dust settled, after the invasion of the Gauls, the map of Europe was quite different. Looked like that. Oh, that's when it started. I'm sorry. This, this is how it looked in the 4th century. If you do a search for a map of the Gauls, you'll find that after the dust settled, it would appear that they controlled one-third of the previous Roman Empire. In 523 uh, AD, this is what they controlled. See that gray area there? You see that? I'd say that's about a third, wouldn't you? That they took over about a third? I'd say so. I think so. So that's what they controlled. Um, anyway, as far as the destruction they did, uh, some historians say that they had, a, again, they, they had a scorched earth policy, meaning they destroyed everything that they left behind. 
One historian in the 6th century, so this was 500-something, probably around 523, said that uh, they destroyed all the cities which they captured, especially those south of the Ionian Gulf, so completely that nothing has been left to my time, that was the 6th century, to know them by, unless indeed it might be one tower or gate or some such thing which chanced to remain, and they killed all the people, as many as came in their way, both old and young alike, sparing neither women nor children, wherefore even up to the present time, Italy is sparsely populated. Again, that's the 6th century. So does it sound like they destroyed a third of everything they come in contact with? Yeah, it sounds like they did. Let's move on. Before we do it, it's also interesting to note, if you do any research on the Goths, you'll be amazed at how many times you see them credited for being a part in the destruction of the Roman Empire. It's incredible. So, now we've got Trumpet 2. Uh, that is going to be the attack of the Vandals. The first was the attack of the Goths. The second was the attack of the Vandals. And again, this is God pouring out his judgment upon the uh, Roman Empire. So, um, and the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. I remember when I was a futurist, uh, all these trumpets just scared me silly. Um, anyway, the next group of peoples or tribes that we're going to look at are the Vandals, and uh, as as you can see, uh, they they fulfilled yeah in okay, they're on the side there four twenty five to four seventy. As you can see, um, they fulfilled their part of the judgment beginning in four twenty five A.D. and completing in four seventy A.D. So let's go back to our map of the uh, Roman Empire in the fourth century. Um, what do you see there about the Mediterranean Sea? The Mediterranean Sea was totally surrounded by the Roman Empire, right? So who do you think controlled the Mediterranean Sea? Well, the Romans controlled the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean Sea was totally controlled by the, by the Romans. The second seal introduces us to the Vandals, all right? So the Vandals was up here. Um, again, they were to the north. Uh, we could do a deep dive, just like with the Goths, and look at the relationship between the Vandals and the Roman Empire, but again, we'll refrain except to say that they had fought some already. Um, there were some of the players in the crisis. That they were some of the players in the crisis of the third century that we talked about in part four of this study. Now, Africa, this is so awesome. Africa had not needed much attention from the Roman Empire in the form of military. You know, you had military all over the cities and stuff, protecting everything. Uh Africa didn't, just didn't need it. Um, it was a relatively peaceful part of the Roman Empire, that is, until the Vandals showed up. In the early 5th century, which is the 400s, they made their way down the western side of the empire, wreaking havoc in present-day Spain and crossing into Africa in 429 A.D. In 439, they captured the great naval city of Carthage which was the most important city in Africa. And the Vandals claimed it as their capital. A lot of the Roman Navy ships was kept at Carthage, a lot. So uh, when they attacked uh, Carthage and they got it, they got a bunch of boats too, all right? So that was, that was basically how the Vandals came down from the north and, and wound up in Carthage. And where you see that end, that's Carthage. Edward Gibbon, again, we mentioned him earlier. And the neat thing about, not that I'm glad he was an atheist, but, um, you know, it's really something when an atheist confirms something that's in the Bible. But a lot of things that Gibbon said uh, confirms what, um, what we're reading here right now. So, um, he calls the capture of North Africa by the Vandals the death blow to the Roman Empire. Now, North Africa uh, was considered the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. It was said by Josephus that the grain that was produced in North Africa fed Rome for eight months, and the other four months, they got grain from Egypt. So, two-thirds of the year, 
uh, Africa was providing them with enough grain to, to support the entire empire. Look at that empire. Man, I mean, that was the breadbasket. Um, the great thing about capturing Carthage by the Vandals was that with it, they also captured a large part of the Roman navy that was docked there at the time. This led to 30 years of the Vandals pirating the Mediterranean Sea and many cities along the coast. That's, that's good work. Nice. Uh, here we also have the sacking of Rome second time in 455 A.D. Well, losing the breadbasket of the empire was a bit of a problem. So in 468 A.D., the Roman Empire, east and west, they joined forces and engaged in a joint military expedition to get Carthage back from the Vandals. And it's called the uh, Battle of Cape Bon, if you want to research it. They took one th every, everybody that I read said they took 1,113 ships. The, the personnel seemed to vary, but the ships always seemed to be the same. 1,113 ships and 100,000 uh, personnel, uh, and again, that number varies, to take back the city. Attempting to land, uh, they ran into a fire ship attack. Imagine that, a fire ship attack, which means that the Vandals took ships, filled them with combustibles and gunpowder, set them on fire, and sent them into the advancing fleet. That's game over. Once the battle was over, according to some sources, they lost 700 ships and 70,000 men. It remains to this day one of the biggest amphibious operations in world history. We've had World War I, World War II, and this was still one of the biggest um, amphibious operations in world history. Isn't that interesting? At the end, the Vandal Kingdom looked like that. Yeah. So, um, there's that. So let's look at our verse again. So they took Carthage, they took a good bit of, of uh, Africa, Northern Africa, and he took all those little islands and stuff. Uh, they're doing pretty good. Did real good. Trumpet. Uh, let's see here. Now, uh, let's read that again. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. What did I just say? What did I just read you? What did I just tell you about the battle? They set a bunch of boats on fire, a great mountain cast into the sea. They set a bunch of boats on fire and shoved them into the Roman Empire's fleet and destroyed it. So um, it was cast into the sea. A third part of the sea became blood. A bunch of people died in that sea. Uh, 70,000 men we just read died in that sea. You think that river, you think that uh, sea became bloody? I'd say it did. And a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. I've been unable to find any uh, anything about the animals, the sea creatures, but um, kind of goes without saying that some of them died, okay? And a third part of the ships was destroyed. So a third part, that's probably right, isn't it? A third part of the ships that was on the Mediterranean Sea was destroyed in that battle. I'd say that's probably right. Seems right. So, all right. So now we move on to the third trumpet. Third trumpet, we got Attila the Hun. 451. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and read that. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Okay, so uh, we've we have learned that when prophetic language speaks of things in the heavens like sun, moon, and stars, uh, they're talking about leaders of a nation, uh, leaders in a political landscape. Here we see a great star from heaven falling upon the waters and making them bitter. That's something. Uh, how could something like this be fulfilled? All right, well, just as a reminder, I do not think I've mentioned this yet, but we are looking at why I quit believing in the rapture. I was told all my life that the book of Revelation was going to be fulfilled in the seven years following the rapture. Uh, remember that? Anyway, we've already discussed the Huns a little in that they were a big part of the reason the Goths came to the Roman Empire to escape their attacks. 
after all the Danube River should have done the trick. Uh, Tilla the Hun, by the way, and you know, that's not a real common name. I don't know anybody named Attila today. But, uh, anyway, he ruled the Huns from 434 to 453. And this guy really had a good time with the Roman Empire. He crossed the Danube River twice and plundered the Balkans. Uh, there's where the Balkans is at. So that red area, that circle there, he enjoyed coming down and, and plundering that area. Um, the Roman Empire actually began to pay him tribute money to stay away. It appears it was, uh, depending on, again, who you believe, it was either 350 pounds to 2,100 pounds of solid gold per year. Uh, so that's that's pretty good. I'd like for somebody to pay me 2,100 pounds of solid gold a year. You know, I'd, a year would probably be all I need. So um, let's see. Uh, also during the time of Attila, the uh, Huns controlled this territory right here. That's pretty good. That's a lot. That's almost as much as the Roman Empire, isn't it? That's pretty good. So, uh, and what they did is pretty much what Rome did. They, um, people just served them. You know, like you'd have your, your little town or whatever, and while there may not be the Huns living there, you were submissive to the Huns. You submitted to the Huns. So, um, let's see. So, they controlled that territory, and I know I keep going back to the original map, and by the time of Attila, uh, this map had actually changed drastically, but I want to keep in mind what the empire was what looked like uh, when all these troubles started. So I, I have a map showing what it was like after the fourth trumpet, but I, I wanted to show you the, the difference right now. So I was listening to a teaching about Attila this week, and the guy said that leading up to this time, there was a general feeling that something terrible was coming. I think I already mentioned that. Uh, you had the vandals and the goths creating trouble. And what was they doing? They were trying to escape from the Huns, who was coming from the east. So now by 440, they were on the doorstep of the Roman Empire under the leadership of Attila. To get to the fulfillment of the trumpet, uh, there is a promise. there was a promise of marriage from the emperor's sister. She sent a thing to Attila. And um, you could really go into this. Um, the gist of the story is that she'd done this to get out of an arranged marriage. She asked Attila to come save her. The emperor, when he found out about it, sent him a letter saying the proposal wasn't legitimate. Anyway, Attila decided to come to the empire and take what was rightfully his, and he decided to bring 500,000 of his soldiers with him. That'd do it. He came down heading westward, and the Visigoth king knew that there was going to be serious trouble. We already looked at where the Visigoths was, over there in, in the Spain area. Um, so he allied with the Roman emperor, and they readied for the onslaught. When I say the Roman empire, Eastern Roman empire. So the battle that ensued is called by many names, but the most common seems to be the battle of the Cantaluian plains or the Cantaluian fields, which occurred on June 7th, 451, around Chalons. That's, that's probably not how you say that, but anyway, there's Chalons. That's where that's where this battle took place. Now history's undecided on if this battle was a draw or was the last military victory for the Romans. Uh, the number of people who died differed from between 165,000 and 300,000, depending on which historian you want to believe. Uh, the Roman historian. Uh, Jordans noted that the fields were, and I quote, uh, piled high with bodies and the rivers were swollen with blood. Imagine that. I wonder what would happen if the rivers became swollen with blood. Two rivers that were no doubt affected was the Rhine and the Danube rivers, uh, which we already talked about. They have their beginning in the Alps, okay? Now, I'm not sure what they done with the bodies of the slain, or the horses. Horses was in that battle. But since it was a draw, it's likely they just simply left the bodies out there to rot in the fields. You know, usually, and I did a little bit of study on this, if you won the battle, then you would gather up your people, you know, your dead people, and take them back and bury them or whatever, you know, especially the generals and, you know, the higher-up muckety-muck people. Um, if you lost the battle, 
you know, whoever won the battle said, I'm not burying my enemies. So there was people laying there dead, you know, rotting in the fields and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, 300,000 people laying in a field rotten by the rivers. Probably not good. And a bunch of horses. Um, since it was a draw, it, likely they just simply left the body to rot in the fields. Uh, that, that was common. Now, uh, prior to the Battle of the Cantaluian Fields on this particular raid, Attila had attacked uh, many other areas in a great wave of destruction. Okay, He was a little ticked. So here's a map from uh, Wik Wikimedia Commons that shows before the Battle of Chalons uh, what he done. They, they call it Attila in Gaul or Attila in the Alps. It's what I call it. So you can see there, he came down, he attacked worms, and you can see on that map, um, some of them were threatened, and some of them were sacked. And the ones that were sacked, guess what it had after he sacked it? A bunch of dead bodies laying around. All right? The sources of water for a large portion, portion of Europe was contaminated for quite some time after this battle. One historian from that time said that many had died, and so he was still living. He said many had died and still continue to die that drank of the water through famine, disease, and pestilence. The water became polluted. What do we see? Let's go back to our scripture. What do we see? All right. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. This is a great leader. Who? It's a star. And one that burned like a lamp. Who is that? That's a tale of the hunt. I think in looking at a great falling star, Attila ruled the Huns. Get this, Attila ruled the Huns from 434 until his death in 453. So what is that, um, 19, 19 years? 19 years? He ruled 19 years? That's pretty quick. That's like, that's like a falling star, just quick, which is relatively short. And his empire, you saw that empire. Let's see, where's that at? Let's look at that empire. You see that empire of the Huns? He died in 453. By 469, it's gone. Gone. The Huns was gone. It's like a falling star. Okay? Uh, is that where we're at? Uh, it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. These are the rivers of the Roman Empire. The name of the star is called Wormwood. That term, Wormwood, is only used twice in Scripture. So we see both times that it's used is right here, talking about Attila the Hun, and it means bitter or calamity. If you look it up in the Strongs, it means bitter or calamity. I think it about, I think it about says it all when we're looking at Attila the Hun. And the third part of the waters became wormwood, and many men died of the waters because the waters were made bitter. The waters were polluted. With what? Decaying carcasses of horses and men and blood. I'm just, it's just, that's just what happened. So I think that's, that's about it for the third trumpet. Uh, one other note, Attila was going to pillage Rome the year after the Battle of the Cantaluian, Cantaluian Fields in 452. That was the year before he died. And uh, so he was going to Rome to pillage Rome. Who do you think met him? You think an emperor met him? You think, uh, the, you know, one of the emperors went out there? No. No, one of the emperors did not meet him. He was met by the Pope. He was met by Pope Leo. And you can research that if you want to. It's an interesting story. Uh, but the outcome was that Attila retreated without invading Rome. The legend seems to imply that Attila saw two giants guarding the Pope and the spirits of Peter and Paul wielding two swords. Okay, okay, that's, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Anyway, to me, not the legend, but the facts that the Pope met Attila and not the emperor lines up with the belief of the reformers about the restrainer from 2 Thessalonians 2. Let's take a look at that. This was the early Protestants believed this quite, um, well, this was one of the verses that made them start looking at the Pope wondering if he was the Antichrist. It says, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. 
For the iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. They believe, and some some uh, some versions call that instead of calling it the the one who letteth, it calls it the restrainer. The the Protestant reformers believed that the restrainer was none other than the Roman Empire, and that the wicked to be revealed was none other than the Pope. While they indeed did exist at the same time, as we see right here when Attila came down to meet, uh, to plunder Rome, as the power of the empire waned, the power of the great Pope grew stronger. And that, if you've watched all of these teachings, you know that there was a time that the Pope was absolutely, without any question, the most powerful man on the face of the earth. How did he get that power? He gained that power as the Roman Empire faded away. Okay? So, uh, now let's go on to the fourth trumpet. We're almost done here. Thank you. If you're still with me, uh, thank you for staying with me. I hope, I hope this is clear. I hope you're getting something out of this. I really appreciate you uh, viewing this with me. So, so anyway, trumpet four. The Her Heruli, they take Rome. They take the Roman Empire. They take the Eastern Roman Empire. It's over. Okay, that's what happens here. Um, Western Roman Empire. Sorry, the Western Roman Empire. I think I mentioned uh, that uh, the other guy hooked up, that uh, the guy from the Visigoths hooked up with the Eastern. It would have been the Western Roman Empire. I apologize. So, anyway, the light purple. So, there's that. Um the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. The term earth here means a region which is exactly what we're dealing with. Now, if you're understanding the imagery that we're looking at, this, this is not difficult to understand at all. The sun, moon, and stars are leaders. We've been saying that the sun, moon, and stars are leaders. So the here lie, I know I'm saying it wrong. Here lie, sorry, um, they're up here. And uh, the here lie had been in this territory again, this was part of the Roman frontier prior to Attila and the Huns coming along, but they'd fallen under his control. There was a time that they were subordinate to Attila the Hun. And then after Attila the Hun died and the, and the kingdom fell apart, well, now here come these people rising up, the the uh, the Herali. So after the Hunnic Empire collapsed after Attila's death, different nations began to reemerge instead of being subjects anyway. And remember, we're still using this map from the beginning so this map really at 476 was totally different. Uh, actually, according to a Wikimedia, at 476, the Roman Empire would look like that. Now, I didn't put the Herli up there, but you know uh, the Herli came from up here. They was up here. So um, amazing you can't find a whole lot about them, but in seven, 476, under the leadership of King Odysseus, uh, met what was left of the Western Roman army in Ravenna. And this was not some incredible battle like the Battle of the Cantilean Fields. Uh, the Romans were defeated easily in two days. Two days later, uh, Odacer went to Rome and told the presiding emperor, who was 16-year-old Romulus Augustus, that it was time to go. He just walked and said, Hey, you, emperor of Rome, you need to go. Came over. It was the fall of the Roman Empire. That was it. The Western Roman Empire was done on that day that he walked in and said, you need to leave. The guy went into retirement. He's 16 years old. He goes into retirement. And uh, that was the fall of the Roman Empire. So here is what was left after that took place. Here is what was left. Boom. Huh. In 476, the Roman Empire looked like that. It was all gone except for the Eastern Roman Empire. And uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, when we look back on it in hindsight, it's called uh, the Byzantine Empire. 
and the Byzantine Empire was destroyed under the next two trumpets, which we will cover next time. Uh, thank you again for joining me. I, I hope you're I hope you're getting something out of this. Uh, God bless you. Uh, I've I've got a teaching out there called Other uh, Resources, and uh, there are other people that teach this. You can get a hold of the you, and it's not hard to find. Uh, you can get a hold of the writings of um, Henry Gatton Guinness. Read up, read what he had to say. Uh, you can look into Adam Clark. You can look into um, Adam Clark. You can get his full commentary for free on eSword. I haven't plugged eSword in a while, but uh, you can get that free on eSword. Um, you know, there's if you want to look deeper into this, there's places to look. And I will be back as soon as I possibly can uh, with um, the uh, the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet and the Renaissance. I love chapter ten. The Renaissance and um, the invention of the printing press and the two witnesses it was all right there. It was all right there in, in history. Praise God. It's awesome. God bless y'all. I uh, hope you have a great week until I, I see you again. God bless you. Uh, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I bless thee in Jesus' name. If you're ever in Hamlin, West Virginia, on uh, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., uh, we have service there at Doorway of Hope on 80, 8036 Lynn Avenue. If you want to reach out to me by email, you can get me at do you know Jesus is for you at gmail.com. God bless you.